Now, one of the cool things about being an author is that you kind of develop some weird skills along the way. Now, those can be pretty extreme if you are someone like a crime fiction writer. Like, you probably know how to break out of a trunk by now or put someone in a trunk. Weird things. There are people who write historical fiction who could totally build you an old-fashioned frontier dwelling or, you know, I don't know, trek across Siberia because they've done all the research for their books. Now, I haven't gone quite that extreme, but I do want to share with you the top four author skills that serve me in real life. Look at this little guy. He doesn't feel good, but he just wants to cuddle, so here he is. Now, my first author skill is being alone. Like, you can leave me alone in a room for a long period of time, or just like, you know, ditch me at the front of a grocery store, and I can keep myself busy for hours. I can plot stories, I can come up with names, I can come up with political systems. Honestly, a lot of my books were started on little bits of micros paper while I was serving and had absolutely nothing to do. I have stacks of micros paper written with early book notes because... It's how I keep myself entertained. So downtime, I'm totally good with it. I'm basically a mobile houseplant. Just, you know, give me some nutrition, some water, make sure I see sunlight every so often, and I'm good. That's really all I need from you. I'm also very good at travel planning. Now, I think part of that just has to do with who I am as a person, but a lot of it does come as an author skill. Like, I can get two teenagers from Rhode Island to Maine. I can move people all around the country because I have looked up the bus maps and the train maps and the plane schedules and all those different things. Oh, honey, that was a sneeze. Oh, he's so sweet. I have looked up all those different things. I've also looked up, you know, how long it takes horses and carts to go and also hiked mountains to see how hard they would get up. So I'm really good at estimating how long it's going to take to get somewhere and how unpleasant the journey is going to be because I have spent so much time researching those things. Author skill number three, I am very good at writing emails. Like, I can email you so hard you won't even know what's coming, which is super useful when, you know, you don't actually want to talk to people face to face, which may also be an author skill. But knowing how to write powerful dialogue, knowing how to set a scene and then best utilize your words to play out that scene, really helpful when you're trying to get your point across digitally. I can set the scene in an email, explain to you exactly what I want done, and close out the scene nicely so that, you know, it's a complete experience for the email receivee. The fourth and most important one, especially to this sweet little guy who I think might be asleep in my arms at this point, I can't quite tell. No, he's still awake. Is that I am not one to take no for an answer. Here's the thing. You can't tell me that there isn't a solution to a problem. I have toppled kingdoms in my books. I have gotten people from point A to point B where it's utterly impossible. I have figured out how to actually round off a love triangle in a way that makes sense. Don't tell me that anything's impossible. If you can get through a love triangle, you can get through just about anything. So recently, they told me that this little guy was not going to make it. Because he's sick. He's my little kitten, Mo. He's one of the two kittens we adopted. We planned on one. This one came, you know, as a bonus prize. And they told me he wasn't going to make it. And first of all, I got very sad and very upset. Because, you know, you don't want your little kitten to go. But then I realized, I don't believe you. I don't believe you at all. This isn't Aragon. I'm not backed into a corner where I have to deal with, like, quantum mechanics in order to save a fantasy storyline. No, there's a way out of this. And you know what? There was. So sometimes you have to use your author skills and decide, no, I will not take this is impossible from you. I will figure it out. And we have figured it out. So if anyone, oh, hi, hi, little guy. If anyone ever tells you that there is no hope for a kitten with FIP or FIP, shoot me an email. Also, if your health insurance ever says that they're not going to pay for your medical tests, there's a lovely little thing called MD Save. This is my week of not taking no for an answer, of telling people I will find alternate (laughs) resources if you don't want to help me. So for medical needs, look up MD Save or GoodRx if you're in America because, you know, sometimes our healthcare system leads things to be desired. And if you're having a problem with your pet, reach out on social media. There are things that 
veterinarians won't tell you because they are protecting themselves. So it took author skills and a lot of digging into weird things to figure out how to help this little dude. But now he is here sleeping in my arms because of those author skills. So it's easy to take jobs like being a writer, being a performer, being in any field in the arts and be like, but I have no practical skills for all the work in the arts I've done. It's not true. Being a performer teaches you to work as a team. It teaches you to think outside the box. It teaches you to communicate, which is a huge thing that a lot of people can't do. Being an author teaches you so many skills, new skills with every book you read. Being an artist, I don't actually understand how visual arts works. I, like, mad respect to anyone who can do it. My poor cover artist knows. I'm just like, colors are nice. I don't, I'm sure there are big lessons that you take out into the world, but I understand none of it. So good for you. You're doing a great job. But in this crazy world where it feels like the arts are unappreciated and there's a lot of people who think they may never get to go back to their art. Yes, you will. We're going to fight our way back out of this. It's going to happen. Oh, kitty, you want to go down? Or are you just flooping? He's flooping. But in the meantime, in the meantime, I can't stop laughing at him. He's so cute. In the meantime, you have amazing skills that people outside the arts do not possess. You have created your own skill set and continue to appreciate them and use them as we survive until this intermission is over. It's going to be amazing. I know. My kitten Mo says so. And in going in line with, you know, things are going to be different for a while, but we will get things back. The Tethering audiobook is now available. It was recorded by a wonderful stage actor, and I am so excited to share it with all of you. So keep watching the video. It will pop up in just a second with a sneak peek at the tethering, or you can click the link above or below, depending on your platform, and it will take you to a website where you can listen to a bit more of the audio files. I am super excited to share this story with you. It's all going to work out. We're going to find a way back one step at a time. Until next time, I would have Mo wave goodbye, but uh, he's passed out. He's completely passed out. Yeah. Jacob tossed off the blanket, ran to the window, and threw it open. And there she was, Amelia Gray. She pushed herself through the window and threw her arms around Jacob's neck. Jacob, she said, her voice full of pain and concern. I'm so sorry. Jacob froze for a moment, unsure if he was actually awake, until the cool night air whispered through Amelia's hair carrying with it the soft scent of lilacs. Emmy, he whispered, wrapping his arms around her. She felt warm and incredibly real. She pulled away to look him in the eye. I came as soon as I heard everything that happened. Are you all right? I'm... Jacob reached up and touched Amelia's face, brushing a strand of long black hair from her forehead. You're here? His voice sounded raw. Are you really here? I'm really here, Amelia said. I came back for you. I promised I would. Jacob, I'm sorry. He pulled her into his arms and buried his face in her hair, trying hard to remember how to breathe. She hadn't changed that much. Her hair was long and black, and her eyes were misty gray. She was taller now, but still her. Still perfect. Are you okay? Amelia whispered. I'm fine. Jacob pulled away and ran a hand through his hair, trying to stop his head from spinning. I think I might be in shock or something. I'm so used to Jim being gone. I guess I just don't understand that he isn't coming back. Is that weird? I don't think so. How did you know? Jacob asked. How did you know about Jim so fast? I mean, I only found out this morning. I know. And I know this is an awful time, but I had to come now before it was too late. He's dead. I don't think there's really a time crunch, Jacob said with a hoarse laugh. The laugh caught in his throat and turned unexpectedly into a sob. He tried to breathe, but it only made the sobs louder. Amelia pulled him over to the bed and curled up in the corner, putting Jacob's head on her shoulder. Jacob didn't know how long he had cried but he hurt everywhere. He hurt like he had run a marathon. His throat was dry, and his eyes stung. He stayed sitting next to Emilia on the bed. 
She had held him as he cried for losing the father who was never there. As Amelia reached up to wipe a tear from his cheek, he vowed he would never cry for Jim again. It was over. Jim was gone. Jacob took a deep breath. Thank you. He looked down at Amelia's hand holding his. I'm so sorry, but we can't stay here. She silenced Jacob's protest. I didn't come here because of your father. I came to get you, just like I promised I would. It's time now, she said slowly. I am so sorry about Jim, but I need you to come with me. Something wasn't right. Amelia was here in his room. They were together, but she looked worried, almost frightened. I came because of what happened at your school, what you did to your school. Jacob shook his head as her words sank in. Is that what the police are saying? I was with Principal McManus when it happened. It wasn't me. Panic crept into his chest. He looked around his bedroom, sure the police were going to break in at any moment to arrest him. The police think it was some sort of terrorist attack. I love how they can invent logical explanations for just about anything. Amelia pulled Jacob back when he started toward the window to look for police cars. They don't suspect you at all. Jacob searched Amelia's eyes, unsure if he should be relieved or more afraid. Who else but the police would come for him? But we know you did it, Amelia said. You broke all those windows. Well, every piece of glass in the building, actually. What do you mean I broke the windows? Jacob, you are special. Different, like me. You have abilities you don't understand, but when you're upset... What are you talking about? Magic, Jacob. Wizardry, sorcery, maleficium, whatever you want to call it. I'm a witch, you're a wizard, and we need to get out of here. Jacob stared at Amelia. He ran his hand over her cheek. She grabbed his hand. Jacob, I'm real, and this is real. There is a whole world out there, a magical world, but you have to decide right now if you want to be a part of it. There are things in my world that are beyond your imagination. But if you come with me, you can never go back to being normal. You can never come back here. Emmy, Jacob shook his head. This is crazy. She brought his hand between them. It was covered in small cuts from shards of McManus's mug. His hand warmed in her grasp. Not unpleasantly so but as though it were submerged in warm water. Then his skin tingled and stung. The places where the skin had been broken became almost iridescent. Finally, the glow subsided, and the cuts started to fade. After a few seconds, his hand had completely healed. It is real. Emilia stared into Jacob's eyes. Will you come with me? Jacob couldn't think beyond Emilia's return. He was tired, and his brain felt fuzzy. His school was wrecked. His father was dead. He wanted to be angry with Amelia, to shake her for making him even more confused, to yell at her for disappearing for four years and for clearly having left out some very important details in the course of their friendship. He didn't understand what was happening. Amelia's hands were so delicate in his he would do anything to keep her from disappearing again. He would follow Amelia Gray to the ends of the earth. Do I need to pack anything? He asked. Only if you want to. Amelia gave him a hard, serious look. Jacob, are you sure this is what you want? Yes. Amelia offered to help him pack, but there wasn't very much Jacob wanted to take with him. He already had everything important packed in a box under his bed. Pictures of his parents, a book his mother had written her name in, all of the notes his father had left on the kitchen table every time he went out of town. Jacob kept the box packed in case a social worker came for him. All he had to do was throw some clothes into a bag, and he was ready to go. He turned off the lights and walked out the front door. He hesitated with the key in his hand for a moment before leaving it in the lock. Under the street light, a very shiny black car waited for them. Jacob didn't look back as he walked to the car. He didn't need to. There was nothing left for him there.